Hello, everyone. I am Brian Love from Trevilian, and I am joined today with my good friend, Mary Jane Crocker from Bridgewater Bank in Minneapolis, Minnesota. How are you, Mary Jane? I'm great. How are you doing, Brian? Doing well. Quick disclosure. She also goes by MJ, which you may hear me say once or twice. But I thought MJ would be a terrific guest for Trevilian next, as we have worked together, um, Trevilian and Bridgewater. And her bank really sticks out to me as quite a beacon for culture, for fresh, inventive culture. And I think the retention of their employees and the attraction for new employees has certainly uh, benefited from that really, really interesting culture. So I'd love to ask MJ a few questions about that today. So MJ, quick introduction to you. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, life before Bridgewater, tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, how you found yourself at Bridgewater. Okay. Well, I've been at Bridgewater since the beginning. So we opened the bank in 2005 and I was the first employee at that time. Uh, prior to that, I had worked with Jerry Bach, who is the founder of Bridgewater uh, at another bank, Commerce Bank in Edina. Uh, he left one day, decided that he was going to pursue other ventures and build the finest entrepreneurial bank in the Twin Cities is what he called it. He was going to do things a little differently and he wondered if I would uh, help him out. So I've actually done everything at the bank from branding to, to HR, to facilities, to technology, to you name it. At the point where you start a new bank, there's nine people, you get to do a little bit of everything. Um, how I got there was... I started banking when I was 16 as a teller in Canada at Canada Trust. Um, that was a long, long time ago. Uh, continued working in the banking space all through college and helped pay for my college through banking. So uh, I guess that was the first thing I learned about banking was how to work at one and then pay, pay your way. Uh, I did do a finance degree, worked in the brokerage industry for a while. My very first job was at the Montreal Stock Exchange where I learned all kinds of things, especially about um, online banking or online trading, which was just coming to be at that point. So that, there were some things I learned very early in my career that actually have just repeated themselves over and over again. Uh, I am Canadian. We moved to the U.S. a long time ago, 30 years ago. Uh, and at that point, I didn't have a green card. So I took a hiatus, took 10 years off, had three kids. And at the point where I was ready to come back into the work world, I did a one of those life coaching classes and it said go back to banking so I went back into banking and here I am today well I can still detect that little bit of that Canadian accent especially yeah, when you say out. about, um, comes about but no that's interesting and I didn't even know about the um the trading um and you know I guess that kind of helps me understand that innovation is kind of embedded in you mm. from an early age so tell me now you know you're at Bridgewater and you know, tell me a little bit more about what makes Bridgewater's culture so different. You know, I think it comes back to Jerry. I think at the point where he decided to build a different bank, uh, one of his big things was being non-traditional or unconventional. He really wanted to build a bank where things were different, uh, where people were enabled and empowered to make a difference and to make their own decisions. Uh, and his, his concept was all about not building a bank that was like every other bank. So be it the way we advertised, the way we hired, the way we built our buildings, the way we built our branches, anything that was unconventional was how he envisioned Bridgewater to be. And so that dictates our culture. And when you're building a culture and you have the luxury of starting from ground zero with your culture, you really have an opportunity to build the space that you wanna build and put the people in the places that you really want to have in those places. You wanna make sure that the people that you're hiring think like you. You wanna make sure that they have the same kind of values that you do. So we didn't, we actually didn't start with our core values at the very beginning. We started them in 2010 as we were starting to grow and have more and more people that we were hiring on. So we identified five core values that today hold very true. Um, and those core values are based on how Jerry works. They're responsive. Jerry's super responsive. They're dedicated. You know, dedication is, is really, really important. Obviously, being unconventional was important. We wanted people who were really growth oriented. So we didn't want 
people who were going to come in and sit in a position for a long time, but rather people who are really looking to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and then we wanted people, obviously, who are accurate. It's a bank. Uh, of course, we have to be accurate. But all of those traits emulated from how Jerry does business and how he envisioned the bank to be. So I think, you know, our culture is just a representative of who he is. And as we've grown now, we have, you know, 220 people in seven branches and, you um, you see those values all through the organization. And I think that's what one of the things that drives culture. So MJ, you mentioned a little bit about your you know, core values. How does that trickle down into the organization? You know, we, um, there, there are probably four things that are really important in the organization. One is that we're really, really transparent. So transparency, uh, transparency is evident throughout the bank. When we do a strategic plan, we do our strategic planning session three times a year. We do one major one, um, but then two kind of mini, mini strategic planning sessions. Everybody in the organization actually goes through a strategic planning session. And um, that strategic plan is shared on two pages across the entire organization. So I think there's real transparency in what we're trying to accomplish. And, and then the way that we communicate that out to the organization. I think the other piece is uh, we are a highly accountable organization. So every single person in the organization has a scorecard um, measuring how they're contributing to the overall goals of the organization. Um, and that also, that also, people also all have anywhere between one and seven projects that they're working at at any given time. And they're all working in that on those projects within the same time frame. So if somebody starts and ends a project at exactly the same time as somebody else in the same organization in the organization does. So I think that accountability piece and being able to know hold people accountable because there's such transparency around what people are doing is important. Um, there's a lot of continuity of practices. Everybody has the same cadence of weekly meetings. Everyone follows the same agenda. Um, so the buy-in across the organization is really high because everything everybody does things at the same time within the same framework, the same, using the same kind of uh, underlying frameworks and templates. And then we make sure that we recognize people as often as possible. So we do have recognition at our all team meetings. We have recognition weekly on our SharePoint site um, with core value recognitions. Uh, we have a lot of team building exercises. We are already a bank that's pretty well networked, but we network internally as well. So we have Thursday Thursdays, which is every third, the third Thursday of every month, we get together as a team and have essentially a happy hour and someone entertains. Uh, we've had a band, an internal band. We've had a musician and a magician um, come and perform for us. So we do a lot of recognition and a lot of kind of team building as well. So those are all ways that, um, you know, we ensure that people play together, have fun together, work together. And again, that goes back to Jerry. I mean, Jerry definitely likes to work hard and he also likes to play hard. So um, those two, he doesn't, he doesn't really separate. I mean, he brings a lot of joy and a lot of play and a lot of fun into the workplace as well. And I've seen the pictures of the, the roof deck. Um, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, it really looks like a fun place to work. Now, an another thing around recognition I mean, you know, there's a lot of talk about raising minimum wage, and, and I just wanted to kind of hit on that. You guys have a $20 minimum wage at Bridgewater? We do. A couple of, about a month ago, well, I think it was implemented in July, we brought everyone who was below $20 up um, to $20. And then a couple of the folks that also were at that level, right around the $20 level, we also raised them as well. Uh, we just saw it as a, you know, we want people to work hard. We want people, we want educated folks to want to work here and feel really, um, really appreciated when they do work here. And so in addition to making sure that our minimum wage is correct, we also try to pay a little bit above what the norm is. Um, and we encourage people to wear a lot of Bridgewater swag. So there's a lot of Bridgewater bank swag in the building at any given time. And people certainly seem to appreciate that uh, as well. We just had a Lululemon pop-up store and People were able to go and get pick up some Lululemon swag oh, and nice. all the on it. So you know, one thing um, you know, we talked about preserving culture through all these these pieces. You're obviously growing extremely fast. Um, you know, 
back to that hiring element, hiring the right people. Um, tell me about the onboarding. You know, some banks don't get that right. And in that first 90 days, people have, you know, kind of second thoughts. Tell me, and you do onboarding extremely well. Um, yeah, we do believe, I mean, we take a long time to hire. As Brian knows, I think the last recruiting binge we were on, I don't know how long it took, but it was way beyond what Brian wanted to <laughs> spend, I think. Um, but once we bring people in, we do make sure that they feel part of the team right away. That was definitely a little harder than during COVID just because people were relocated. Um, we are all back in the office now and so our onboarding's back on track. But when we do onboard someone, we give them a 90 day plan. The 90 day plan is essentially at their, at their own discretion as to how fast they wanna complete that. It includes everybody they need to meet, all of their, their uh, first, their top five priorities for the first 90 days. And for people who are at a higher level, we also give them a SWOT analysis. So we allow them the opportunity to do a SWOT analysis and then present back to the leadership team what they saw in their first 90 days as far as strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And that's been really helpful as a leadership team to see kind of how people perceive us when they come in. Um, we give everyone an ambassador. So somebody unrelated to their position that just kind of can tell them, where should I go get lunch? I mean, that kind of thing. Um, we have what we call BWBU, which is uh, a two-day program that we put people through where every single functional leader comes and speaks about how their department functions and what they how they interact with the different uh, different parts of the bank. And we put every single person through that program. Uh, we have a leadership team meet and greet breakfast that everybody attends. We do that monthly. Um, we do, uh, we set somebody up with check-ins on a regular basis. So they're meeting someone every single week, uh, learning a little bit more about the organization. And then we never hire to a branch. We only hire to the organization. So that way, all of our all of our hiring is um, streamlined, and the same people are doing the interviews at the same time, so that we're making sure that we've got continuity as we're bringing people into the organization. They're joining Bridgewater as a whole. They're not going to. They're not being hired into the branch in Uptown or the branch downtown. Hmm. So I think that's um, people have spoken really highly of our onboarding program, and I do think that they feel really uh, acclimated by the time they get through their first 90 days. So yeah, we spend a lot of time on it. Yeah, and it's something else you just said that stuck out to me a few minutes ago, you mentioned that everyone participates in some level level of strategic planning mm -hmm. from bottom to the top. Yep, so we do, when we do our strategic planning, it's a trickle down effect. So the leadership team does the strategic planning to start with. Uh, once we're done that, then we host many strategic planning sessions with every single department over the course of two weeks. So we try to, because we have that regular cadence of strategic planning, assigning projects, and then projects completing strategic planning starts again, we wanna make sure that we get the strategic plan communicated out to the organization within a two week time frame, so that they can get started working on the projects that they've, that they've taken on. Okay, oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. And I know that, um, one thing that uh, everyone gets on their way in, maybe even during the interview process, is your awesome culture book, Our right? culture book. which I think is a thing of beauty. It, it, it is one of the best documents um, to, you know, to just describe a bank's culture than I've, that I've ever seen. You have oh, one handy? I do. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Um, yeah. So, you know, I read, I think it was Starbucks that originally came out with a culture book. I think, I think it was called like the green book or something. I can't remember. And so as we were starting to evolve and bring in more and more people, we decided that we'd create our own culture book, which would help people understand what the expectation, what they should expect as a member of Bridgewater. Um, and then how they could, how they could expect to be seen, how they would expect to see somebody like Jerry understand that if he's in flip flops and a t-shirt, that that's perfectly normal. Um, understand that we like to have as much fun as we can in the workplace. And so the culture book has a lot of pictures in it, um, but it also talks about how do I become a BWB team member and what are the expectations of this job? So I think it, exp it explains it as a community welcome as opposed to an employee handbook. Okay, MJ, the next question I had for you 
uh, is around something that's near and dear to me, to Trevelyan. It's about recruitment. And obviously, full disclosure, we've helped you find uh, a few um, you know, terrific uh, members of your team. And one thing that always struck me as exciting is that the median age of employee at Bridgewater is somewhere around 33 years old. So when you have younger people like that, you know, they obviously want to see that there's a trajectory for them. So retention and recruitment of the best talent is really the question, you know, that I have for you. What are your best practices around that? You know, I'm really proud of the fact that out of the uh, 47 people that we hired this year, 40% of them were referrals. I think that speaks volumes about how people enjoy working at Bridgewater and how they feel that they can develop at Bridgewater. Um, because of our growth, we've also been able to uh, grow people internally. So somebody like our chief lending officer started as a credit analyst. Now he's our chief lending officer and he's just turned 36 yesterday. So I think the program that we I think people see opportunities at Bridgewater. They may come in at a ground level, but there's lots of opportunities for them to develop. Um, they like being together. Like I had suggested earlier, we do a lot of, we do a lot of um, activity. We have a brand new building that we just built with a brand new deck. Um, and the deck, every single night, there's people out on the deck. We have a barbecue, we have a smoker, we have a fireplace, we have bags. People like working with their co-workers. And that goes back probably to the way we hire um, people that have similar kinds of attributes and core values. We also pretty much always hire people that have university education. Um, and so they're all growth oriented and they're all interested and curious about learning. And I think that, you know, that's something that people have in common. So they like their, their you know, they, they see an opportunity and they can develop into it. Um, as we're hiring Currently, we've had so much acquisition opportunity acquisitions in this area geographically, um, and so we've really taken advantage of identifying someone that we want at a different bank. Um, again, Jerry's been really instrumental in identifying talent that he wants to bring on board, and then as he's seen opportunities, kind of courted that person along the way, and as soon as there's an opportunity for them to change positions, he's make he makes sure that he's. Um, in there to, to make sure that per person knows that Bridgewater, it would be a great home for them. Um, so there's a courting process that we use for a lot of our producers. And that's, you know, tributes to Jerry and making sure that he gets the people that he really sees out there that are standouts. Um, and when you bring those people into, they bring their, their, bring their people with them. That helps build our credit team, that helps build our business development team, um, and our, certainly our servicing team. In addition to that, we've been fortunate, as you know, Brian, to work with you and um, have built our leadership team based on the, the, the work that Brian's done. Um, knowing what our culture is, knowing what our skill set is, uh, and being open minded about not having someone come in that fits in a, the box or the job description completely. Um, I think, Brian, you've been incredibly creative in finding the right people to fill some of our really important positions on our leadership team. And I think that's just uh, have, being creative, being investigative, and understanding what we need, even when we didn't necessarily know that that's who we needed. Yeah, and I think back to, you know, two of the searches, the, you know, the chief deposit officer, Lisa, that search actually kind of started out as something different. and kind of morphed along the way um, due to some of my recommendations and some of the candidates you saw. And I think it wound up being more of a success because of that close um, relationship that you have, you know, with your recruiter. Yep. And so, you know, sometimes there is no substitute, especially for niche roles like that. So, you know. Well, I think, I think the other interesting thing is, and, and, and our chief positive officer is a great, was a great, that, that was certainly a great example I mean, when she came to us, she came to us from a big old bank that she'd done the same thing for a long time, but her skill set was really going to be really helpful to the organization just because she has such great exposure to other areas of the bank. Mm -hmm. um, and we were eventually going to really need that. So that was, that, that was, had you had great foresight in putting her in that place. The other thing I think that's interesting is we do, we have built our foundation over the course of the, time, of the years. And as we start coming up with positions, we didn't have before that all of a sudden we need. And I think an opportunistic hire was our most recent chief risk officer. So, you know, in that case, Brian, you saw 
uh, person that would fit into our organization that we didn't even have know we had an opening for at the time. And um, that kind of partnership has been has been really great because I think he's going to work out really well as well. He's been here for a couple of months, really enjoys the environment, definitely is a culture fit and has great knowledge as well. So, and we wouldn't, we really wouldn't have made that hire for another six months hadn't it not been for you recognizing the character of this person. Yeah. Well, my pleasure. And, and, you know, I, I have a sixth sense about these things, you know, um, well, he, so it's not all it's not all sunshine and roses, though. Sometimes people fall out of fit. You and I have had conversations about this. Yeah. And I think a lot of banks that watch you know, this video might want to kind of understand, you know, how do you pe- how do you deal with people that fall out of fit, culture fit? You know, it's not easy. Um, I've done my fair share of letting people go and it's never an easy conversation. The next day is always a lot better than you think it's going to be. Um, but we do have a policy of, or a slogan, I guess, that we hire slow and fire fast. Um, it's really important if someone is not fitting into your organization, be they the wrong cultural fit or be they the wrong person in that seat. Um, we make sure that we move them out pretty quickly. Uh, the, we do have a right person, right seat phrase. So sometimes it's the right person and they're a great culture fit. They're just in the wrong seat and finding a new home for them in, inside Bridgewater We've done plenty of that, Um, but we've also had people that just, you know, they've been here for four or five months and they're not working and we part ways. Um, With our growth as well, I think lots of times people, the the position outgrows that person and that those are, those are sadder um, goodbyes because those people have been instrumental in getting us to where we've gotten to, but they really can't get us to the next level. Um, Mm -hmm. Those are hard and I think what what you have to be thinking about is they're better off, you're better off. And as you're sitting, waiting to try to figure out what to do with this person, the rest of the organization is also watching and knowing you're not being authentic about really having the right person in the right seat. So we have a, we have a conversation about, are you a core value fit? We go through all the core values. And then we have a conversation around, get it, want it. Do Do you understand this job? Do you want this job? And then do you have the capacity to truly do this job? And that, that certainly leads to a, a conversation that starts the exit. Hmm. Yeah, and, and it seems to me a fast, fast growth organization like a Bridgewater, um, there's different moments in a life cycle where some of the talent that was there earlier is no longer the talent you need in 2021 or, or whenever it is. Yeah. So it, it seems like that strategy really does fit and also the fact that you guys have scorecards and consistent communication throughout the year with your people, there should probably be no surprises. People yeah. kind of understand where they stand. Yeah. And, you know, we've been really fortunate of the nine people that we started with, we still have the five, five of the original people. Um, and some of them, you know, we had one person who was our CFO for a long time. And then eventually that job just got too big. And, and that person's now in a risk, in a risk job instead. And, and we've been able to manage people down um, and manage people up. So I I don't I can't say that it's worked every single time. There's certainly we certainly had a had some our struggles on that front as well. But for the most part, we try to be respectful of everyone and know that people, all everyone has something to offer. Maybe it's not to Bridgewater, but it's you know there's a talent that they can take elsewhere. Sure. Well, with that being said, I think I will adjourn for today, but thank you so much, MJ, for your time. Thanks for spending it with me. And thanks for allowing our viewers to take a portal into one of the more unique bank cultures that's out there at Bridgewater Bank. Thanks, Brian. It was a pleasure to talk to you as always. All right, look forward to further communications in the future, MJ. Take care. Bye.